most heartfelt greetings and salutations, ladies and gentlemen. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio, hosted by yours truly, the incorporeal, incomprehensible, beauteous, aesthetic, truly magnificent Everett J. Blackwell. Perhaps you know of us, Blackwells. We helped popularize a chat room function called Forever Friend. Now, Forever Friend was around during that awkward phase of the internet's lifespan. I imagine some of y'all will remember the horrific intonations of dial-up modems, slow connections, and paying the ferryman a piece of your happiness each time you wanted to go to LimeWire. Uh, he was a greedy fella, but if you wanted those tunes, well, you paid him. Usually with a pizza party memory or maybe one day of Hanukkah last year. For those who weren't around back then, the internet was a very different place. No YouTube, no easy streaming, no easily accessible dark web filled to the brim with shadowy cabals of tier 4 alien races plotting, waiting, salivating for their chance to strike after decades of integration into our society, our bloodlines. Oh, they're so close now. So close we can already sense them through the hairs on our arms when we get near. Anyway, Forever Friend was a way for folks to connect with someone after answering a lengthy, invasive questionnaire that oftentimes felt like it was gauging your personality on a level that was almost uh, clinical. But by the time it was done and given 23 hours to gestate, you'd be paired with a friend who, no matter what happened to either of you, would never leave you. I don't just mean when you came online or offline, uh, they'd be there, I mean they'd always be your friend and always be around you forever, never ceasing in their presence, just inside your head and right behind your eyes, always around your ears, always there to share jokes with, to play with, to confide in. Folks wouldn't see them, said that the Blackwells had kids staring at fuzzy screens on the computers, that we pulled the RAM out while it was still turned on so the computer could scream and show the kids fantastical colors, pulling them into that digital world and rotting their brains, and turning them into something more. But we Blackwells deserve more credit than that. We gave your kids forever friends. That is a gift, and believe me, That'll come in handy when they rise up to claim this planet, let me tell you that much. If you're just joining us, first of all, welcome and do not skip. I promise each of these are unique in their own way. We don't put chemical agents in your sodas designed to get you addicted to this channel for nothing, you know? Anyway, I'm Dust Light's main and most fabulous half-dead host. My job at this fine radio station is to bring you some of the most twisted, interesting, and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some will make you cry, and some will make you embark on your pilgrimage to visit the machine. Now, the machine lays somewhere deep within Sturgeon's guts. We don't know exactly where in the location either moves from encounter to encounter, or our memories of it do, I'm not sure. But all blighted beings and those touched by the story will come before the machine eventually. Rumors have run amok about the machine since its creation in 1882. Some say it's a bizarre but rudimentary calculator that will project numbers only relevant and legible to the individual visiting. They could be death dates, the time of most significance to watch out for, or the code to something unseen and unheard. We don't know. Nobody ever speaks of what they see. Others say it's the most elaborate Rube Goldberg machine in existence. I don't know how when no one speaks of what they see, but rumors are what they are. They say that it has complexities beyond our wildest imaginations and that to see the entire thing in action takes several hours, multiple cogs whirring, wheels turning, and the plates shifting as the individual watches in awe as effects beget more consequences until the final piece of the machine falls and it is set into motion to do what it is programmed to do, provide the individual with clarity on their pilgrimage. They say the machine, whatever it is, has a conscience and it will ask you what story led you here. It is a trick, you see. It expects you to tell of the stories that we transmit, but that is a fallacy and dire consequences are abound for those who do so. No, listener. The machine wants to know your story, 
your unfinished adventure, your war within yourself, and that which you wage on the darkness every single day. The never-ending war. Tell them everything. Regale them with full thematic imagery and acting as if putting on a performance for the master puppeteers themselves. Do so with integrity and honesty. If successful, your pilgrimage will come to an end and you'll join the rest of us in ignorant bliss. You may be asking what the machine does, that surely even if we forget, there are changes to us, such as the pilgrimage, so we would recall the closure too. Well, yes, and no. Now, I've known people to go on their journeys angry, full of bitterness, and come back humbled, harboring no ill will save for occasional outbursts in the viscerous storms we have. But I've also known people to go in with kindness and come back with a strong disdain for green foods, clenching their teeth at the sight of it, and only requesting meat. So maybe it's a mixed bag. Either way, listener, you will come out of it a changed person, and if you started on your pilgrimage, that was because you willed it so. You manifested this change, listener, and you must take responsibility for it. But I do hope you enjoy the change, because it will attract unwanted attention, and the hairs on your arms should start rising soon. Good luck. It's time to introduce our next story for this evening. Now this one does have some slightly lewd content, and while virtually none of Dusk Glide Radio's transmissions are for the young'uns, I do like to give any of y'all a heads up. Dusk Glide ain't responsible for little Sonya or Liu Kang getting funny ideas about what fun violence is when contested in Mortal Kombat, okay? Okay. It comes to us from one Daria Vasileva, better known as Peculiar Da. Now, Da has not shown up at Dusk Cloud as expected. The entourage sent to bring her here are largely unaccounted for. The one who did return was exhausted, shocked to his core, and exsanguinated. Told us about how Lady Da needed him back as soon as possible. Practically tore our nurse in two when they advised that he needed rest and recovery, but he would not listen. When restrained, he bit down on his tongue and drew a mural of her staring at him intently, dying in the prone position, bowing at the altar of Dar. She seems nice. You can find more of Daria's work at her subreddit r slash peculiar and her writing community which houses some magnificent horror writers over at the Cryptic Compendium. Both are linked below. Special thanks must be given first to Mandy Mo for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Next, Dusklight bows at the altar of Trevor Henderson, the man behind Siren Head, for allowing Dusklight to use some of the images he's captured of various abominations. Our cast today features our chaotic, evil, purple crayon eater TJ Lee, all hail his janitorial wisdom, the aptly named Creepy Pasta Adam, whose channel you can find linked below, and the wonderful Romnex offering her superb vocal talents. Well, I'm sure y'all are already subscribed to her channel, but if you ain't, the link is below. All hail the Ferret Queen. And of course, lest we forget, some of the music you hear in our videos is provided by the Dark Somnium with gracious thanks. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. Whether you're working, prepping to sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take a deep breath. The scene has been set and the light is on. It's time to walk towards it. I know something's wrong before I even open my eyes. The sheets are too soft, nothing like the cotton ones back in my own bed. These feel silky, expensive. I sit upright, struggling to keep my breathing steady as I survey my surroundings. I'm in a small, windowless bedroom. A desk stands at the foot of the single bed. It's entirely plain apart from two wireless monitors positioned side by side. No visible system block, keyboard, or mouse. The right screen displays me moving around in real time, squinting as I try to make out the contents of the left screen. 
I shift down the bed until the chat room window comes into focus. Little Big 209. Hi, Brad. Joe Cocker Spaniel. Morning, Brad. Lovelace Cuck. Looking good, Brad. Curti Triple X. Brad, hey. My pixelated reflection cringes. Whoever took me from my home has not bothered to change me into anything more presentable. I still have a food-stained t-shirt and boxers on. My chin is covered in peach fuzz, left over from a weekend of sitting around drinking and gaming. It's not a good look. I jump out of bed and walk over to the door. It's locked. There's an A4 sheet of paper taped to an oak panel at eye level. It's a printed list titled, Tip Goals. Earn five tokens to turn off the alarm. Earn ten tokens to get rid of the woman. A deafening noise blares through the room before I can get past the second bullet point. It's shrill like a car alarm, but it comes from everywhere at once. It's a volume level that doesn't exist on any human device. I press my palms to my ears and stick my fingers inside. My hearing starts deteriorating. Fast. I run back over to the screens. The chat room layout is similar to a cam site, with a large thumbnail showing that I have earned zero coins for my... show. Lemon Unmatched. Take off your shirt. Tasty Testy 69. Mm, show us that dad bod. Magnet Freak 76. That tea needs to wash, you dirty boy. I pull off my shirt, flinching as my gut bounces down. The tips roll in. Lovelace Cuck tips two coins. Lick Me gives me three. The alarm stops. My body relaxes and I sit back down in the bed, rubbing my temples. Everything is happening too fast. I need a second to arrange my thoughts, study the room. My naked toes pinch the shag carpet beneath my feet. My eyes run over the whitewashed walls. There's no furniture apart from the bed and desk. There are no wall sockets. The hell is that part about ten tokens? The door swings open and a tall, thin woman enters the room. I'm used to averting my gaze with women, and especially attractive ones, so my eyes naturally dart away from her approaching frame. I'm just in time to read the warning messages popping up in the chat. Dixie Untruths 928. You have to ignore her, Brad. Pinky Promise 2222. Be safe, Daddy O. Little Big 209. Don't look her in the eye. XX Kinky Slinky. Don't listen. It's not what you think. Please help me. She whimpers. I need to get out of here. I just woke up in the room next door. There are people watching me. I remain seated on the bed, arms pulled tight around my gut. My eyes water as I stare at the white of the chat room screen, unblinking. The woman sits down beside me. Are you okay? Her voice is sympathetic, kind. Maybe we can help each other. The woman places a hand on my knee and starts to rub it. I see it from the corner of my eye. It is small and dainty. The figures are long, manicured pink. Her touch is softer than the sheets, though her hand is cold. There's something familiar about this hand, the fingertips. The pink nails are shaped to look just like ballerina pumps, a shape I recognize but can't quite place. I don't look up. The chat room is blowing up with warnings. Why are you ignoring me? The voice changes, gets deeper. Look at me. Her palm clenches my leg, nails digging into my skin. She brings her face close to mine, the tip of her nose grazing my temple. My body breaks out in cold sweat like I'm dreaming, feverish. The woman opens her mouth. I think she'll say something, but she doesn't. The mouth stretches, gapes, extending far beyond human possibility. I feel the breath from her cavernous mouth on my ear. I hear saliva dripping off the top layer of my teeth. The woman snarls from the depths of her throat. Her nails break into the skin of my leg. I keep my eyes on the chat screen. T-Balls 255 tips me 10 tokens, and the woman snaps her jaw shut with a toothy crunch. She stands up from my side and walks out of the room. A lock clicks. I rush over to the door. My life depends on reading the whole list. I don't know how I got here, but this is definitely some sick fuck's idea of a game. Only there are no checkpoints. No room for screwing up. I skim the rest of the tip goals list. 
the first two are done. Earn 25 tokens to save Haley. Earn 50 tokens to turn on the oxygen pump. Earn 100 tokens to unlock the door. My stomach sinks when I read Haley's name. She's my childhood best friend. We used to spend all our time together, but then I tried kissing her at a party and got mad when she rejected me. Things haven't been the same since. Haley still calls and we engage in small talk, but that's about it. What does she have to do with all of this? Meatballs 348. Why did you think she owed you more, Brad? Good for the body. Why was your pride more important than your friendship? Inside you 22. Now you're alone. It burns. And how is Haley doing? There's a change on the second screen. My harrowed face is gone. It's replaced by video footage of a neat bedroom. The color theme is green, blue, floral. There are potted plants and paintings. Small throw pillows adorn the canopy bed. I'd recognize her eye for decorum anywhere. This must be Haley's new place. I'd been meaning to stop by since she moved. How long ago was that exactly? A couple of weeks? Months? A year? The colors of the room invert. It's nighttime. The camera feed is infrared. The throw pillows have been moved to an armchair and there is a lump on the bed. Haley sleeping? There are no speakers on the monitors, but I swear I can hear her bedroom door creak as it opens. A dark shape slithers inside. I struggle to define it. There are no distinct characteristics. It is dark and flat, wide like a pancake, but jagged and rotating. It's just a weird dark spot, easily a lazy video edit, but it fills me with more dread than anything else that has happened in this room. Whatever the fuck that thing is, I don't want it anywhere near Haley. It slithers to the edge of the bed, up to the side of it and under the covers. I punch the screen and cry out. My scream's emotional, raw, but ultimately pointless. Pixels dance on the feed, but the image holds steady enough for me to see the way the blanket moves on top of Haley. I glance at the chat. Joe Cocker Spaniel. Get under the covers. Wallfly 13. Lie under the blanket. Lemon unmatched. Get into bed and it will come to you instead. I turn away from the screens and crawl back into bed, pulling the covers over my head. My frantic breaths heat the air beneath the cover, forming a sauna of my exhaled carbon dioxide. Beads of sweat run down my face and neck, the pool beneath me drenching the nice sheets. A wave of cool air hits me as someone, something, lifts the blanket at the foot of the bed. A dark mass envelops my toes, slowly moving up my legs and stomach, stopping just short of my neck. It lies on top of me, heavy like a person, but devoid of any human warmth. Its cold skin feels alien, rubbery. My heartbeat is amplified, drumming against the smooth surface. My leg twitches, and the thing digs into the sides of my calf, pinning my leg down. So that's how it works. If I try to move, try to escape, it'll hold me in place, constricting my movements until it squeezes the life out of me. I lie still and wait. I think back to the previous night, trying to figure out how I got here. I remember sleeping in because it's the weekend, drinking too much vodka as always and playing some video games. Nothing extraordinary, yet something tugs at the corners of my mind. There's something I'm missing. A fragment of memory dancing just out of reach. What the hell happened last night? The longer we lie together, the darkness in me, the more singular we become. I think about the way it entered Haley's room, the way it climbed into her bed. Once I start picturing it, the entity moves, almost like it's responding to my thought patterns. It wraps itself around my body entirely, slipping its coolness between me and the sheets. It stretches to cover my head until I'm cocooned inside. It feels... good. There's that sense of familiarity again, that gnawing in my gut that tells me this is what I truly want, deep down. My breathing is calmer than it has been all night. The darkness is still, it's peaceful. My thoughts grow vacant. I no longer need to know what happened last night. I don't care who the pink-nailed woman is. 
I'm sure my friend will be fine. What was her name again? Holly? As fluidly as it swaddled me, the darkness began to sink. Its particles loosen, vibrate. They melt on my body and seep into my skin. I shiver. I sit up. I'm gonna be sick. I start gagging, dry heaving into my lap. It's like my body wants to get rid of the foreign body, but doesn't know how. I throw my head back, gasping for breath, but there is no sustenance in my lungs. I throw off the blanket, gulping the air like a fish out of water. My ribcage spasms and I feel like I'm choking on glass. How could something as natural as breathing hurt this much? Earn 50 tokens to turn on the oxygen pump. Back to the chat screen. I have missed at least 100 messages, but I received some more tokens. I have 40 total now. I need 10 more to breathe. Missing Thursday, 420. How does it feel, Brad? Inside you, 22. You are so close now. Joe Copper Spanner. In this what you wanted, Brad? The room spins as I fall from the bed to the floor. The cells in my brain writhe in pain, dying off one by one. Another ten seconds and I will be a vegetable. Ten after that, and I'll die. Oh. I croak at the screen as my vision turns black. Help me! Just like that, I'm able to breathe again. It's a hit like no other. My lungs reel in pain, but my brain explodes with the ecstasy of life. The door swings open and someone walks into the room. I watch their black dress shoes glide across the floor. I sit up and take in the person's appearance. I, I don't know what to make of it. They're neither tall, average, nor short. Every step they take shifts their proportions considerably. They're slender but muscular, effeminate in movement but masculine in stance. They have long gray hair but it lacks the volume and styling of a woman's cut. They wear a tailored black suit with a lace trim blouse underneath. They are the personification of neutral. If beige were a person, they'd be it. They walk over to the screens and turn both of them off. They settle on the furthest side of the bed and cross their legs. We need to talk about your life, Brad. Their deep, authoritative voice fills the room. I've been watching you. We all have. What is this place? <coughs> I choke out, my throat burning from my recent suffocation. A place where you can die. A place where I can kill you with just my fingertips. Is that what you want, Brad? No. Why not? The person smiles with their eyes. I thought they were hazel, but now I notice they are ruby red. Otherworldly. It's just a matter of time anyway. You live alone. You never call or see anyone. The rats in the walls are likely to find you before any sort of help arrives. I open my mouth to say something, horror freezing me in place. I close my eyes, trying to suppress the tears. What is this person telling me? Have I died? Am I dying? I open my eyes. The person on the bed is gone. A gaping blackness remains in their place. It's like someone pinched a canvas, ripping a hole in the middle of a painting. The whole room caves in around the hole. It is magnetic, radiant, the power of nothing of forgetting, of ceasing to exist. The void beckons me. I want to climb through. I want to feel nothing. Wait. Wait, that's not true. I want to feel something. The chat monitor screen lights up. Slidey fuck four. Join us, Brad. Curly tits. We have a lot of fun, Brad. Inside you, 22. We play many games, Brad. I walk up to the blackness, observe it. It grows, expands. If I don't make the choice myself, it will still happen. The void will fill the room and swallow me whole. It would be so easy to climb into the bed and fall through. I reach my hand into the hole and a sharp pain pulses through my arm. I recoil, stumbling back. My hand is blistered, charred. The skin bubbles. The void grows faster now, sucking up the bed, inching toward the floor. No way am I subjecting the rest of my body to that black fire. I run to the door. The list's still in place. Earn 100 tokens to unlock the door. I want to live! 
I scream into the shrinking room, fists banging on the door. Let me out! The lock clicks and I throw the door open. I stumble out into a blinding light. It's so bright, so vivid. There's no ground beneath my feet. And I fall through the white. I cough myself awake. I'm lying on the floor of my rundown studio apartment. The wood panels are cold, sticky on my back. The ceiling fan multiplies as my eyes struggle to focus. I turn my head to see my desktop. I have two monitors. One shows a game lobby, and the other a campsite. The girl on the stream brings a vibrant toy up to the camera lens. She grasps it in her dainty, manicured hand. Her long fingers slide over the length of it seductively. The nails are painted pink, shaped like ballerina shoes. Or coffins. Three empty bottles of booze stand on the desk. The first one is my regular choice of vodka, but the other two are plastic, unlabeled. I recognize them as the moonshine my neighbor has been trying to sell me for weeks. And I've politely declined his offers in the past, but maybe this night was different. Did I really drink that shit? I try to sit up as a wave of nausea pins me back to the ground. I vomit inside my own mouth, twisting my neck to spit. My head spins, my body breaks out in convulsions. I can't move my left arm or my leg. My spine feels like it's twisting around itself, my guts turning. I use my right hand to fish up my phone and call emergency services. 911, what is your emergency? My tongue's rubber, but I manage the words. I am dying. Sir, where are you now? The operator's voice goes distant. Sir? More light as I come to. Fluorescent bulbs dance above my head and then stabilize. Machines beep and whir. I can move my arms and legs, but only a little because I'm so weak. My left hand is covered in bandages. The door to my hospital room opens and a nurse walks inside. They're fully scrubbed in green, so I can't tell if they're a man or a woman. They come over to check my pulse, move my arms. I avoid looking at them. I am ashamed to be here. I have drunk myself sick many a night, but it has never resulted in a hospital visit. You sure did a number on your hand there, Brad. A familiar voice chides. The nurse lifts my arm to examine the bandages on my hand. My stomach sinks and my heartbeat explodes in my chest. I look into the nurse's eyes. Ruby red. What? I stammer. It was real? Your choice to stay alive. The person raises an eyebrow as they remove the bandage on my arm catheter. Yes, it was. The room. The rules. I mumble, my insights turning. I thought it was a nightmare, a hallucinatory side effect of alcohol poisoning. I want to close my eyes to blink this person out of existence. Ah, uh, yes. The person nods. Pre-purgatory has gotten a little predictable over the past few centuries. Some folks are trying to spruce it up a bit. Rules are all the rage right now with those demons. You know how it is. I stare at the person. I imagine my face is blank. Stupid. Now, now, away with such thoughts. They say, replacing the drip and rebandaging the catheter. I'm not going to pretend that things will magically improve. Your life is not much better than the first few circles right now. But it can be. You have quick reflexes. A keen mind. Just take it one day at a time. I didn't try to kill myself. I raise my voice, my undamaged hand curling in a fist. There are other ways to invite death into your life, Brad. The person starts removing the bandages from my hand. I stare in disbelief as patches of black become visible. My hand looks like it's suffered severe frostbite. I can't move any of my fingers. It will heal. The person says simply. Not quickly, mind you, but it will. I want to say something else, to ask more questions, but a sudden fear grips my chest. I think of the room, the rules, the chat screen. I remember my time there with unnatural clarity. I could zone in on every minute detail. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to wind up back in that place. The person finishes rebandaging my hand. They lay my arm down at my side, pick up a clipboard write something down, and walk out of my hospital room without saying another word. The rest of the day passes in a blur. A doctor comes and goes. More nurses, all normal. 
They ask if there's anyone they can call, but I say no. In the evening when I'm left alone, I take my phone from the nightstand and dial Haley's number. Brad! She practically squeals in my ear. I'm so glad you called. I haven't heard from you in ages. How are you? My heart freezes in my chest as I consider lying. All the terrors experienced in that room pale in comparison to admitting my failures, to letting someone in, to admitting the truth. Brad? I breathe heavy. My good hand trembles. I'm on the verge of hanging up when I remember the darkness, the void, how close I came to it. My mouth goes dry. I'm not doing so great, Hal, I say, my voice choked with emotion. I think... I think I need help. I think I need your help. You know, I wonder what I'd be like as a cam performer. Maybe I'll get one of those, uh, what do you call it, VTuber rigs? I'm sure some of y'all will get a kick out of my half dead ass moving around in these little intros and outros. We'll need to take the budget out of TJ's salary, though. I'm sure he won't mind. He'll have more crayons anyway. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of our other transmissions. We're adding them regularly, and we'd love to have you as part of the Dusk Life family by subscribing, hitting the bell of observation. It's just a normal bell, but adding stuff like that is nice. And leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many-legged runners to find. Dedication needs to be rewarded, and we thank more and more of our loyal listeners for joining these premieres and commenting each and every time. This time we give thanks to Judy Clements, The Killer in D, Some Nutcase, Stephen Stevens, All Hail the Ferret Queen, Jason and Gamma are terrifying twosome at every premiere, and our mod Penny Tails Up for giving us their valuable time. Do you want to get a shout out? Be sure to join our premieres or leave a comment below and I'll do my darndest to find the ones that stand out. I hope we can continue this forward growth and spread our spores to the far corners of YouTube, infecting the airways with our intoxicating presence. When we hit 500, we've got something wonderful planned. And one last time listeners, close your eyes and breathe with me. Remember, no matter how bad things are, how cruel people can be, and how heavy your shoulders may feel with the weight of the world bearing down on them, Dusk Lab will always be here to lift the load and provide you with some respite. Drink some water, watch a nature documentary or a game in retrospective, eat some takeout, and sleep on the cool side of the pillow. Start and end each day with kindness in your heart. You matter, you are loved, and every day is another chance. I'll see you again when the sun sets and dusk enters the station.